الرحمن الرحيم وأفضل الصلاة وأزكى السلام على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين سيد المرسلين محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين وأصحابه المنافقين إلى قيام يوم الدين Dear respected viewers, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I begin by saying Ramadan Mubarak to you and to your families and to your friends and dearest ones and I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that this holy and blessed month of Ramadan passes by and we have achieved the, great, the greatest rewards and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses us in existing in the coming months of Ramadan next year and the year after and that we benefit from the holy month of Ramadan with what we can we are human beings therefore we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the sins that we have with the ability that we have with the shortcomings that we have that he allows us to fit Ramadan into our lives once again we have had 11 months without Ramadan once again Ramadan wishes to enter our lives we say welcome O Ramadan once again and inshallah we benefit from you as the greatest month inshallah when the holy month of Ramadan reaches us once again we find many people speaking about the benefits of fasting and we find many people wishing to advise our youth how we can benefit from the holy month of Ramadan inshallah in today's program I shall be speaking and at the same time advising myself of how we can benefit from the holy month of Ramadan there are ways and methods the human being can benefit from the holy month of Ramadan which are very simple very very simple at the same time we oversee them and think that we need to strive very hard and pressure ourselves in order to satisfy Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whereby this is not the case Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants ease for his creations Therefore, three simple methods how we can schedule our days in this holy, blessed month of Ramadan. Firstly, what is the month of Ramadan? The month of Ramadan is a month where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls onto His creations to come closer to Him. The three months of Rajab, Sha'ban and Ramadan are months which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is focused on the most by his creations Rajab, Sha'ban, and Ramadan however Ramadan Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself calls onto his creations to come and worship him it is the best of months and its days are the best of days its nights are the best of nights its hours are the best of hours Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us so much that the breathing of the fasting person is considered tasbihat in other words we are rewarded for the breathing that we perform while we are fasting and the sleep of the fasting person is a form of worship ibadah no musa'im ibadah therefore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this holy month is doing nothing but showering his creations with his blessings everything you do is something to be rewarded for therefore with this as a basis for this holy month how can one benefit from this holy month of Ramadan as we said three simple methods we shall be explaining today the first thing which we can benefit from in this holy month of Ramadan and acquire great amounts of rewards and good deeds is feeding the fasting people people who fast in this holy month of Ramadan oftenly suffer from hunger the act of feeding itself is a ritual in Islam narration states that Rasulullah promised a woman paradise for walking in the desert and quenching the thirst of a dog a thirsty dog Islam has placed the foundation of giving whether it be through zakat through charity through any other form of means of giving Islam loves people giving to each other whether it be a smile, a dua, wishing them the best, anything 
as long as you take from yourself, from your time, from your income, and spend upon the other person. Another matter, which Islam also stresses upon, is dua. When you want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless you, it is stated that for a dua to be accepted, or to increase the probability of your dua in being accepted, one prays for his neighbors and for other people, then he would pray for himself. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees this person and says, this creation of mine is praying, but he's not praying for himself. He's praying for other people. He's praying, but for other people. Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam once entered the home and saw Fatima al-Zahra, Sayyidat Nisa al-Alameen, salawatullahi alayha, praying, and she was performing dua. Imam al-Hasan alayhi salam said to his mother, he said, Ya Ummah, I hear that, O oh mother, I hear that you are praying for everyone except us. Fatima al-Zahra then said, Al-Jar, thumma al-Dar. First we pray for the neighbors, and then we pray for ourselves. Therefore, the act of giving, whether it be a dua, a smile, good wishes, food, a glass of water, is something heavily stressed upon in Islam. And its rewards are greater than what we think. The reward is that whatever you request, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you. And we can learn from this narration where Rasulullah promised a woman paradise for quenching the thirst of a dog, a thirsty dog in the desert. Therefore, the act of giving. In Ramadan, we have people who are starving, people who are hungry. These people are not hungry because they do not have money. These people are not hungry because they cannot afford to eat or they do not know how to cook. These people, they wish to live hungry days. Why? For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fasting for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fasting itself is a ritual. Therefore, quenching the thirst of the fasting person of the time is also a ritual. Quenching the thirst itself of anyone. This water doesn't have to be your water. You can be going to the masjid, holding a glass of water. Anyone who comes in, you offer them this glass of water. It could be a food spread. You pick up the glass of water from the food spread and you hand it over to any sa'im. This act of quenching the thirst of the sa'im is something amazing. The reward it brings along is amazing. One cannot compare. And I shall share with you a story of quenching the thirst of a thirsty person, let alone quenching the thirst of someone who is a sa'im, a fasting person. The eminent muhaddith, a shaykh, Abbas al-Qummi, radhwanullahi ta'ala alayh, the author of Mafatih al-Janan, which we all own and possess in our homes. One day he was sitting in his home, and he had guests which had come to visit him from a very far place. They were thirsty. Sheikh Abbas al-Qummi also needed water. He called on to his father. He said, oh father, come and get us water. The people were all shocked as why would Sheikh Abbas al-Qummi request from his father to get up and bring him water? Because obviously ordering your parents to do things for you is disrespectful. The father of Sheikh Abbas al-Qummi comes with a jug and a glass. He quenches the thirst of everyone in this gathering. And then he returns back to where he brought the jug of water from. The guests tell Sheikh Abbas al-Qummi. They say, Ya Sheikh Abbas, what is this that we see you doing? Some of them were actually reluctant about drinking that water because they thought that this water was brought through disrespect. This is the father of the most eminent alim of his time. How can someone drink after seeing such a moment where the child orders his father? This father is someone who is very revered and we need to be grateful to that father for producing such a child. Therefore, many people were reluctant in drinking. However, when they saw Sheikh Abbas al-Qummi drink, they all drank. They finished the water. The father of Sheikh Abbas al-Qummi returns back inside the home. They said to him, Ya Sheikhana, Sheikh Abbas al-Qummi, what is this that we see you doing? You have asked your father to bring you water. 
Isn't this disrespect? As Sheikh Abbas al Qumi says, no. Quenching the thirst of any Muslim, any Muslim we say here. However, we know that quenching anybody's thirst. But Sheikh Abbas al Qumi said, quenching the thirst of any Muslim is loved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not only is it loved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is one of the most loved acts by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Therefore, I wanted the most loved person to me, which is his father, to be achieving the rewards of one of the most loved acts to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is where they made the salawat. And they understood why Shaykh Abbas al qumi Therefore, if you wish good upon yourself and you wish that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses you with great amounts of rewards and good deeds, you try and quench the thirst of the thirsty people. And I guess after this small introduction to quenching the thirst of thirsty people, we understand why Abu al-Fadl Abbas insisted on bringing water to those thirsty orphans and women and soldiers in the battlefield of Karbala. Now we know why he died in order to go and bring that water. Now we know why he died, why he was martyred, why he placed himself in such a danger, taking the sack of sheepskin it was before that they put, they placed water in, empty, and he would go to the river in order to bring this water. And as he was going, he would face thousands of soldiers, thousands of cowards, all for what? For that type of reward. Because Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas had seen his status after his martyrdom, where he would be. Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas knew that in order to achieve that status, I need to defend my Imam. And I need to defend the women of my Imam. And part of this defending is taking care of the women, taking care of the orphans. And Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas salam did what he could. Now we understand why quenching someone's thirst is very important. Another matter where we can benefit in this holy month of Ramadan with is the act of feeding hungry people. This act of feeding hungry people does not have to be feeding people by inviting them over to your home. No. For example, in Africa now, we have many Muslims who are hungry, who are starving, and they believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They fast the month of Ramadan. When the time of iftar comes, they have nothing to eat. Before Ramadan, they had nothing to eat. They were starving, hungry. However, now they have changed their intention to fast and not eat for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sending a few dollars, a few gifts to these poor families. If you know someone, who resides in poor Muslim areas. Send them a few dollars, send them money. Tell them to feed such and such orphans. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will place a blessing in that income which money has been taken out of in order to service the Muslimin, in order to quench the thirst and feed hungry Muslims in the holy month of Ramadan. Another <coughs> matter, or shall I say, the second point which we can benefit from throughout this holy month of Ramadan is recitation of the Holy Quran, reciting the Holy Quran. We hear this a lot and I'm not going to be repeating what, what other scholars say and what speakers state. We know the Holy Quran is important and we know that we need to be reciting the Holy Quran. However, why is it that in the holy month of Ramadan, we do not benefit from the holy Quran? Let us bring the holy Quran in our lives once again. Why not? 11 months have passed. We probably haven't finished the Quran once in this entire year. The holy month of Ramadan is here. And Ramadan itself comes with a blessed ritual. The ritual of obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 24-7. And it comes with an amazing schedule where it, over, it takes over your day. 
It makes you someone who fasts. By fasting, it controls your tongue, it controls your eyes, it controls your ears, it controls your heart, it controls where you go, it controls who you speak to, it controls your intentions, it controls basically your entire day. An amazing schedule. And it adds into your days. Now we find many programs which happen throughout the holy month of Ramadan that people complete the entire Quran throughout this month, one juz a day. Why don't we recite this juz a day? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala states in the holy Quran <coughs> that his prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam complains to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from his nation. And this complaint is from us and our forefathers. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa qala ar-Rasul Ya Rabb inna qawmi attakhadu hadha al-Qur'an mahjura And the Prophet stated, O oh Allah, my nation has abandoned the Holy Qur'an. The Holy Qur'an did not state, did not use the word my nation had left the Holy Qur'an. No, because when you leave something you can come back to it. The word which has been used is Mahjura. They have abandoned the Holy Quran. Now, I will give you an example of the eloquence of the Arabic language and where it can be used. This is an example and we do not wish to compare. When a man wishes to abandon his wife, they say, Hajara imra'ata. He has now abandoned his wife which means he has decided to leave his wife and no longer come anywhere near to her, never become close to her. In other words, you decide to leave something when the human being decides to leave something forever. They call this act Hajar. No longer wishes to see it. No longer wishes to become anywhere near it, associate himself with it. The Holy Quran refers to the Holy Prophet saying that Rasulullah has witnessed his Ummah as they have abandoned the Holy Quran. They have left it, turned a face away from the Holy Quran. Many people wish to believe this. They say, how is this possible? Or that maybe the Holy Quran is exaggerating or maybe it's from the eloquence of the Holy Quran that it used the word Mahjura instead of they have left Tarakul Quran. It is not really something to be surprised about. Let us take a look at our own schedules today. Our schedule is to wake up at such a time. Wake up at such a time, we either study or we go to work. When we come back, we deal with our personal matters. And then we deal with our family. And then we go out and do what we, what we desire to do. <clears throat> take a look at our schedule. My schedule yesterday, your schedule yesterday, and the week before and the month before. Is there a place for the Qur'an within our schedules? There's no place. Therefore, in other words, we have made a schedule how to exit the Qur'an from our lives. It's just the other way around. And just looking at it from another angle. We have made a schedule which the Holy Qur'an does not exist in. It's like making a schedule where we have taken the Holy Qur'an out of our lives. Therefore, let us come back to this Holy Qur'an. Hold on to it. Wallah, my dear brothers and sisters, every sin we make, and we are sinners, we are all sinners. Every sin we make, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, why? Isn't this the act of the day of resurrection where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks us about our actions? What was the reason for you to be performing such an act. If you say you did not know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, I gave you the manual of life. I gave you the Holy Quran. This Holy Quran, which is laying under the dust. Did you know that each particle of dust on the Holy Quran, we will be questioned about. We sin and the Holy Quran, the guide to our salvation. The only salvation that we have at a time like this our absent Imam, Ajjal Allah Ta'ala Farajah Sharif. What more can we ask for when Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala says here, and we have left it 
to lay under the dust. Be sure that we shall be questioned for each and every dust, about each and every particle of dust which has laid on our Qur'an, which we have abandoned while we remain sinning. It is important that we understand the Holy Qur'an while reciting it in the holy month of Ramadan. We have many people who have abandoned the Holy Qur'an and who have become wicked people throughout their daily lives and then wish to come back in the holy month of Ramadan and recite the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most merciful, we believe in that. However, let us repent before entering the month of Ramadan. Let us repent before engaging in the practices of worship in this holy month of Ramadan. Say, Ilahi, after this month of Ramadan, I want to be a different person. Someone which satisfies you. And I wish to live a different life, a life which you are satisfied with. There is no point in remaining on our sins and then reciting the Holy Quran. Remaining to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then reciting the Holy Quran. This does not work. Many people might say that it should work because the Quran is light and light Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala places in our hearts. Yes, the Holy Quran is light, but in order for that light to shine upon, there is a need for us to welcome that light. One day, Amir al muminin Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi, was walking with one of his companions beside a building. This building, whether it be a place of worship or a home or an event, and they heard a beautiful recitation coming out from this building. The companion of Amir al muminin said, Ya Ali, take a listen at this amazing recitation. Listen to it, Ya Ali. What do you think? Amir al muminin nodded his head and he said, Kam min qari'in lil-Qur'an wal-Qur'an yal'anah. How many people are reciting the Holy Qur'an and the Qur'an is cursing them? The companion of Amir al muminin was very disappointed. He said, Ya Ali ibn Abi Talib, I did not expect you to say such a thing. Anyway, Amir al muminin did not reply to him. Days came and days went. Time passed by. Amir al muminin Ali ibn Abi Talib engaged in one of the battles against the hypocrites, against the kuffar. This companion of his was with him in that battle. He fought alongside Amir al muminin Salamullahi alayhi. After the battle had finished, Amir al muminin called that companion. He said to him, come, take a look at this soldier who is on the floor, <coughs> killed in the battle. Who, what do you think of him? He said, Ya Amir al muminin this soldier is from the enemies, from the kuffar who had come to fight you. Amir al muminin said, no, this is not my question. Take a look at him. Do, do you recognize him? He said, no, Ya Amir al muminin he said, this soldier is that man who was reciting the Holy Qur'an. And today, we find that the people who are supposed to be holding on to the Holy Qur'an are not holding on to the Holy Qur'an. And the people who do not have an idea what the Holy Qur'an is speaking or saying, they have held on to the Holy Qur'an. Type Surah Al-Fatiha on YouTube. Who comes out to you? Our Wahhabi Qari, our Wahhabi reciter. The Qur'an is speaking this way, the Wahhabi is going the other way. Indeed, the Qur'an is cursing them. But how can we learn from this? How can we learn that we need to go with the Qur'an and not distance ourselves away from the Holy Qur'an? Therefore, we need to make sure that we hold on to the Holy Qur'an. We are Muslims. Our children, inshallah, will be on the wilayah of Amir al-Mumin Ali ibn Abi Talib However, can we guarantee that our grandchildren and our offspring and our progeny will remain Shia. Therefore, we need to hold on to the Holy Qur'an. The Holy Qur'an is our only way out with understanding. Therefore, let us add the Holy Qur'an onto our schedule during this holy month of Ramadan so that we may benefit from it. One juz a day. We have narrations that people, companions of the Imams, used to finish the Holy Qur'an one time a day. Imam al-Sajjad is known for finishing the Holy Qur'an countless times. 
a night. Do not think it's impossible. This is called kalam amal, the speech of action. When you say you're going to do something, you'll do it. Therefore, our third matter in which I shall be concluding this presentation with is our dua and our ad'aya, the supplications and duas which Ahlul Bayt have stated and have recited and have prayed with, which are considered a form of sunnah for us to be practicing by. Ahlul Bayt have placed a track for us to be traveling through which takes us nowhere other than paradise. And this is where we want to go. In the holy month of Ramadan, many people become bored. What shall I do? I have nothing to do. There is no excuse. You have Mafatiha al-Jina. You do not understand Arabic. There is English translation. It has its own tra transliteration there as well. There is no excuse whatsoever. <clears throat> and I do not wish to elaborate too much about this matter. But we should not waste our time in Ramadan. We might be wicked people throughout the entire year. But let us hold on to Ramadan. Let us pressure ourselves that this Ramadan, I will be a different person. Women who we chat to, people who want things from us. Tell them, month of Ramadan, I shall not speak to you. The holy month of Ramadan is something we really need to understand. And not one presentation or ten presentations can cover this. However, let us take this month seriously. The fact that Laylatul Qadr is placed in this month of Ramadan. And our Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib departed from this world during this holy month in the act of sujood. Let us treat this month with dignity and honor. Dua is a form of linking ourselves with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <coughs> our dear brothers and sisters who come from outside to the holy land of Karbala. They believe that by staying in the, in the, in the shrine, the Hadra, two hours, three hours, the entire night, they are increasing in spirituality. There's no doubt in that. However, Wallah al if someone wishes to remain in the holy shrine of Abba Abdullah al-Husayn, the shrine of Amir al-Mu'minin alayhi salam in Baqiya, for 10 years, your entire life remain in that place. None of it is important. What's important is that one second you connect with the Imam. That one second you connect with the Imam. If you connect with the Imam through Ziyarat Ashura, if you connect with the Imam through Dua Kumayl, if you connect with the Imam through Sahif al sajjadiyya that one second where you connect with the Imam, that is what's worth everything. We need to connect with Allah subhanahu. Connecting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very simple. Dua kumail. Dua kumail is how we connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Many people wonder, how do we connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through dua kumail? Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib is the one who taught kumail to perform this dua. He taught him how. Many people think that this dua is actually a dua of Amir al-Mu'min Ali ibn Abi Talib. This is not the case. Amir al-Mu'min Ali ibn Abi Talib does not need a dua. And I would like to say this because we are speaking about supplication. Many people state that, and there are books in this regard, how we can interpret dua kumayl and what Imam Ali was asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for. And this is, this is a disaster. Because Amir al-Mumin Ali ibn Abi Talib, salamullahi alayhi, did not make that dua. This dua is not from Amir al-Mumin alayhi salam to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Dua Kumail is Amir al muminin teaching Kumail how to supplicate and how to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In other words, teaching us how we can perform the dua. Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib does not need a dua. Who said Imam Ali needs a dua? Why are people performing oppression towards Amir al muminin Ali ibn Abi Talib? These people, they have no idea who Ali ibn Abi Talib is. No idea whatsoever. They speak about Arfan. And they speak about philosophy. Real Arfan 
real arfan, if you want to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, real arfan is a ma'rifa of Ali ibn Abi Talib. You know Ali ibn Abi Talib, you're arif. You don't know Ali ibn Abi Talib, you're not arif. You can know everything in Islam. If you do not know Ali, you are not arif. Arfan is knowing Ali ibn Abi Talib. Dua Kumayl and our various duas which we have, if the Imam is speaking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, praising him, that is not a dua. That is called munajat. He's praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, the dua, for example, dua kumail, which is amazing if we can recite in the shrine of Abu Abdullah al Hussein, in the shrine of Amir al Mu'mineen, in the middle of Ramadan, on a Thursday in the middle of Ramadan. Absolutely amazing. The feel which you achieve the feelings which live within you at that moment. Dua Kumail. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. Undescribable. It's a lifetime moment. Taking a look at the ad'aya of the Imams. In Dua Kumail, those who state that the du'as are actually the Imams asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, asking them for what? Allahumma ghfir li adhanuba allati tahbusu dua Therefore, it is important that we take a look at this, this ad'ayah. What is the Imam saying? Imam is teaching Kumail, Imam Ali alayhi salam, how to perform dua. What does he tell him? He tells him to say, Oh Allah, forgive me the sins which prevent my dua from reaching you. These sins which block my dua from reaching you, forgive me those sins. He's teaching Kumail to say this exactly. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can forgive him. However, we have people who come and say, this is Imam Ali alayhi salam speaking. What is this nonsense? Imam Ali is the dua. Imam Ali himself is a dua. If you need something, you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through Ali. Now Ali needs something for his dua to reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Does Ali need forgiveness? What does Ali need forgiveness for? And this is an opinion, I tell you. That yes, Dua Kumail is the Dua of Imam Ali and Kumail learned it from him. No, never. Imam Ali was teaching Kumail how to perform the Dua. Imam Ali never once did he recite Dua Kumail. For what? He doesn't need anyone to forgive his sins. And some people in the opinion of Imama, they say that the Imam has the ability to sin, but he does not. This is what makes him great. How ignorant can you be? How ignorant can you be? What makes the Imam great is the, the, the fact that he cannot sin whatsoever. The Imam does not even think of sinning, let alone him being able to sin, but he chooses not to. No, the Imam does not even think of sinning whatsoever. Imam Ali is the dua. Imam Ali is the dua. Didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, the wasila to me is Ahlul Bayt? We ask Allah through Imam Ali. It makes no sense for us saying that Imam Ali needs to go through something to reach Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This entire universe is about Imam Ali alayhi salam. Everything is about Ali. There's nothing in this world that doesn't link back to Ali ibn Abi Talib. It's all about Ali. The universe, the sun, the ocean, prophets, it's all about Ali. Nothing other than Ali. Didn't Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, Oh Muhammad, if it wasn't for you, I would not have created the planets, and I would not have created the sun, and I would not have created the oceans. Didn't he say that? Didn't he say right after it, and if it wasn't for Ali, I would not have created you. Meaning Khatamul Anbiya who is worth all of the Prophets, 124, 123,999, including himself, 124,000 Prophets with the planets, with the sun, with the oceans, with the entire universe, would not have existed if it wasn't for Ali ibn Abi Talib. It's all about Ali. We state the dua. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for what we want. In order for what? In order that we reach a stage of satisfaction that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is satisfied with us and that we enter heaven. 
Is there anything we wish for other than this? We need to go to heaven. Yes, yes. Who owns heaven? Without Ali ibn Abi Talib's confirmation and approval and stamp, no one enters heaven. It's all about Ali. And these people come and they say that Ali ibn Abi Talib needs forgiveness. What type of a mind states this? The mind that states this is a mind that does not know anything regarding Ali ibn Abi Talib. Arfan is knowing Ali ibn Abi Talib. Then you're a Arif. You know Ali, you become a Arif. You don't know Ali, you don't know anything. No way in your religion. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, the dua, supplication, in the holy month of Ramadan is one of the most essential practices of worship which the human being can link with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us and to allow us in this holy month of Ramadan to be people who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is satisfied with, the Quran is satisfied with, the Imams are satisfied with, this treasure, this A'mal of Ramadan which is available in our books such as Mafatih al jinan Let us practice these A'mal so our Imams know that we actually care about their Sunnah. Sunnah is not only the Sunnah of the Prophet, Sunnah is also the Sunnah of our Imams. Let us hold on to the Sunnah of Amir al muminin let us cry this Ramadan. Let us ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us tawfiq. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless you throughout this month of Ramadan and allow you to be of those who benefit from the coming months of Ramadan. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.